Hello and welcome to Antinatalism this week. We have a lot of things to cover. We have antinatalism events, we have some very nice and notable videos, some antinatalist articles and also some pronatalist articles. So let's get on. Global Priorities Institute is a research center at Oxford University. They arrange a series of lectures each year in memory of Derek Parfit. Derek Parfit was a famous philosopher and author in population ethics. As part of that series, this year there is a lecture by Theron Pummer on June 12th, Wednesday with the title Future Suffering and Non-Identity Problem. Looking at the abstract, there are some interesting claims. We can be morally required to ensure that the quality of life of future people is higher rather than lower insofar as this involves reducing future suffering, which is negative welfare. However, we are never morally required to ensure that the quality of life of future people is higher rather than lower insofar as this involves merely increasing future happiness, which is positive welfare. My solution to the non-identity problem captures the procreation asymmetry while avoiding implausible forms of antinatalism. What that solution is and what implausible forms of antinatalism means we'll only know in the lecture. The lecture can be attended online and the booking is available for a whopping zero pounds and zero pence. So if you're interested, please register your booking. I will include the link in the description. There is a new meetup event happening about procreative ethics and extinction on 8th of July, 2.30 a.m. Indian time. So depending on your time zone, it might as well be on July 7th. This is actually a part two of the discussion that happened in March this year. The discussion will be recorded and will be available on YouTube. They'll be discussing topics of procreation and its relation to extinction. Also, Shauna Shifrin's consent argument and Ashil Singh's extinction to that. And they also have a detailed PDF of the topics being discussed. I'll include all the links in the description. Talking of meetups, there is an antinatalist meetup happening in New Zealand in Christchurch on 1st and 2nd of June at the timings that you see on the screen. And these are local New Zealand times. So the probability is by the time this video is out, these meetups have already happened because New Zealand is so far ahead even off my time but nonetheless these meetups have been happening continuously since start of this year there would be more to come and i would be reporting on them in the coming episodes speaking of new zealand 88th episode of the exploring antinatalism podcast was released and it was an interview of vito strati who is a philosopher and an antinatalist activist in new zealand and is also one of the moderators of r slash antinatalism subreddit which has like 218,000 members. So that's many hats to wear. In the podcast, Vito shared how he actually wanted to have kids, he wanted to become a father, and ridiculed Benatar's arguments when they were first introduced to him in his school. From there, he went on to become an antinatalist activist, which is quite a journey. He also talked about how he agrees with the philosophy of veganism in principle, and how the two philosophies, veganism and antinatalism, have so much in common. The commonality is not just in philosophy, but also in the spheres of activism. One difference he pointed between the two was that in case of veganism, you have to take decisions every day when you have food or when you're buying footwear, etc. But in case of antinatalism, you just have a vasectomy once and that's it. You don't have to keep thinking about it or make decisions every day. And I think that's not really the case. If one has a longing for having one's own child, but they are antinatalist for ethical reasons, then they would continuously think about it. On the other hand, with veganism, once you go vegan, in a few years, it does not seem like you have to make any decisions. It becomes as simple as not eating stones because they are not food. Similarly, Similarly, not eating animal products because they are not food and so on. Also, if one is child free, it is easy to decide not to have kids and then forget about it for the rest of it. But if one is an ethical antinatalist, then one is constantly thinking about the suffering beings created in the world. So my point is, things aren't that straightforward. Anyway, coming back to the episode, they also talked about the nuances of moderating the subreddit and also doing activism in New Zealand. Vito seems to be a unique combination of a philosopher and an activist. We don't see that overlap so often. Anyway, then they start on a juicy bit of a new ism called anatalism which Vito discovered. Vito has written a paper on this but has not published it yet. The idea is that the burden of justification should be on those who procreate as they are the ones who are bringing a new being into existence. They are the ones who are doing something to someone else. So the default position should then be just a non-pronatalist position. It might not necessarily be antinatalist but just a position that I'm not convinced with pronatalist arguments. Vito gives some comparisons between atheism and antitheism to explain this idea. On similar lines he says one can just be an anatalist instead of antinatalist. He also points out that this is different than child freedom, which is based on personal preference, whereas both anatalism and antinatalism are ethical positions. On the face of it, this new ism looks promising in the sense a lot of people might actually be 
feeling this way rather than feeling antinatalist. So it would be a good addition to the language of procreative ethics. Vito is in the process of getting his paper peer reviewed and hopefully we get to read it soon. Overall, a nice and deep discussion. So thanks to Vito. And as always, thanks to Amanda, who is now just 12 short of a century. Tofu Dog posted another video of her Come Talk To Me outreach. This time she was talking to a Christian pastor. And as much as I would disagree with the pastor, Credit to him for having a calm, matured and yet casual discussion on the topic of antinatalism. At one point he said that one can be an antinatalist if one were not a Christian. And that is surprising to me because there have been Christian sects in the past who were antinatalists. Anyway, it was an interesting discussion and once again very entertaining to watch. There was a video by Benedictine The Truth about whether or not antinatalists should celebrate their birthdays. The contradiction he's trying to resolve is that if antinatalists feel that this world is a prison, then why would you celebrate a day that you came into existence? He says he celebrates his birthdays nonetheless because he's proud of his resilience, his struggles in life, etc. But I have a slightly different opinion on this. I personally don't celebrate my birthdays, but I don't see a contradiction in antinatalist celebrating theirs. The analogy of prison to this world in the conventional sense of prison does not fit here. There are many purposes of imprisonment, but the most relevant here is that of retribution. You've committed a crime in the eyes of wider society, might not be a moral crime necessarily, but at least a legal crime, and you should be punished for that. And for that, you should feel punished. Of course, there are other aspects to imprisonment like human rights and dignity and so on. But the main point is you should not like being in prison. Otherwise, it defeats the purpose of imprisonment. Secondly, getting out of prisons is thought to be good even in the minds of prisoners. But that's not how coming into existence is. One, you were not brought here as a punishment for a crime that you committed. Although some religions believe that as well. And two, evolutionary biology makes sure that you like it here. So a more fitting analogy to life is Stockholm Syndrome, where the one who is kidnapped falls in love with those who kidnapped them. So then there is no contradiction if they start celebrating the fact that they were kidnapped. In that sense, if we celebrate our birthdays or our existence in general, it's not a contradiction. The only difference is antinatalists are aware of this syndrome and make sure to not perpetuate it further. What you're seeing on the screen is a snapshot of World Happiness Report of 2024. As you can see, Finland is the happiest country this year and it has been at the top for the last seven years in a row. So Finland really must be the happiest country. And I'm happy to report that antinatalism has reached the happiest country in the world. In his series of anti antinatalism around the world, Lawrence hosted this week Mati Hairi and Veera to talk about antinatalism in Finland. Now, if you've been watching this channel, you would know about Mati Hairi, who is now a certified antinatalist philosopher. To know what I mean by certified, watch Lawrence's video. The video starts with interesting story of Mati's journey. He started his adult life with wanting to have twins, one boy and a girl. And then on from there, he ended up becoming a full-on antinatalist philosopher. Whereas Veera is the translator of antinatalism handbook in Finnish language. They discuss antinatalism in different aspects of Finnish life, like social, religious, even political. There was a discussion about how many people in Finland feel that they live in the shadow of Russia and how that impacts their natalist attitudes. They also touch upon how Mati and Veera interact in their personal spheres with regards to antinatalism. And then also about Mati's work on rock operas and his future plans to produce more on the theme of antinatalism. Mati's recent lecture about Omelas in Helsinki University and also his editorial in Helsinki in Sanomat were discussed. There's also a brief mention of Yona Rasanan who has written a few papers about antinatalism and also on links between antinatalism and veganism. I have been calling him Juna by mistake by the way. Overall a pleasant and interesting discussion but I would also like Lawrence to interview somebody from Afghanistan which was the last country in the World Happiness Report of 2024. There was a new podcast in Filipino language on antinatalism. Now I could not get the trans Script, let alone translate it. I tried on YouTube and I also tried on Spotify. I also tried to translate the description, but I could not figure out whether this is for antinatalism, against antinatalism, or whether they were just making fun of antinatalism. So if you happen to know the language, please let me know in the comments below. And I also put the link in the description, link of both Spotify, podcast, as well as YouTube. Juna Rasanan had written a paper called Should Vegans Have Children? Examining the links between animal ethics and antinatalism. To that, Louis Austin Ames had published a response paper criticizing Juna. We had reviewed Louis's paper in Antinatalism this week's episode of 19th of May. I will include the link of that in the description. Well, the news is that Juna has responded to a part of that argument in a very short paper titled Reconsidering the
explaining the utilitarian link between veganism and antinatalism. In that, he only responds to the utilitarian part of the argument and says that he has responded to the criticisms about rights-based argument elsewhere. I am happy to report that what Juna had said in this paper is not very far from what I had said on 19th of May. Or at least I think so and if you think otherwise, please let me know in the comments. Let's have a quick look at what Juna is saying. The criticism was that if we consider the total well-being of children and the well-being of parents as a result of having those children, then that might outweigh the suffering of children and suffering of parents by not having those children. This is not the case in factory farming. The well-being of animals, even though treated well in factory farming, plus the well-being of people who are eating those animals cannot be outweighed by suffering of animals in factory farming because simply the suffering of animals is enormous. To this, Juna says, if one could increase the well-being of animals in factory farms so much that their well-being would outweigh their suffering, I doubt many vegans would accept such practices. If this assumption is correct, then these vegans would either adhere to veganism for non-utilitarian reasons such as rights-based reasons or their moral justification for veganism might align with negative utilitarianism. Very roughly, negative utilitarianism says that one should be more focused on preventing bad things from happening such as preventing pain and suffering than causing good things to happening such as generating well-being and pleasure. If preventing suffering is prioritized over ensuring pleasure, then vegans who adhere to negative utilitarianism may also advocate antinatalism as preventing potential suffering would outweigh the pursuit of pleasure for the child or parents. Etty Hellisum was a Jewish author who was killed by the Nazis during World War II. Before being killed, she once had become pregnant and performed a crude abortion on herself because she did not want to bring another being into existence. This story is told in the newly published book, Begetting, What Does It Mean to Create a Child by Mara van der Lucht. We can read about it in a new article published this week on theatlantic.com. A particular passage from the article about Etty is very poignant. Etty Hellisum, writing in the Nazi transit camp of Westerbork, where she remained for several months before boarding a train to Poland, where she and her family were killed, Hellisum insists that life is glorious and magnificent even as she bears witness to the misery around her. Her searching examination of her own existence left her full of gratitude, yet still did not compel her to give life to someone else, for how could she insist or predict that the person might face the adversity she experienced with the same extraordinary grace? This missing concern for the child-to-be is also what Mara points out when she argues that childbearing is too often framed as a matter of desire and capacity, wanting and not wanting children, being able or unable to have them, when it should be a moral one, procreation is the greatest philosophical problem of our time. The article also points out Mara's two important assertions, that a person cannot consent to being born and second, that there is high likelihood they will experience at least some suffering in their lifetime. The article talks about the writers, novels and philosophers covered in the book along with Mara van der Lugt's personal journey to the question of antinatalism. One interesting point to highlight is about environmental antinatalism to which Lugt says, even if we were to solve climate change tomorrow, the concerns raised by antinatalists, the potential harm and horror of human life are still on the table. When the question of climate has been answered, the question of begetting remains. The article also presents other reasons which people have for having children, which the book considers and then rejects, like biological urges, longing or love for children, gift of life, and finally concludes by emphasizing the need to ask questions in this matter. Overall, a well-written article about what appears to be a well-written book. There was an article called Be Sterile and Subtract on wordonfire.org by Richard Clements. Word on Fire seems to be a religious Catholic website and Richard Clements is an author who writes on topics related to Catholic faith. In this article, Richard starts by giving an overview of voluntary human extinction movement and then moves on to Benatar. He raises some objections to Benatar's view of antinatalism. While talking about Benatar's axiological asymmetry, he asks, what is the relative quantity of pleasures and pains in excess life? And what is the quality in terms of intensity, duration, etc. of each of the pleasures and pains experienced by X? The point he's trying to make is pleasure in life Life might outweigh the pain in life. This could happen through quantity or quality or the mixture of the two. The quality would include intensity and duration of pleasure or pain. And if the total amount of good is greater than the good of absent pains and not bad of absence of pleasures in case of non-existence, then existence could be an advantage over non-existence. So let's have a look at this in terms of axiological asymmetry. Richard is saying that the net good on the left hand side of this diagram where the person exists could be more than the net good on the right hand side where the person does not exist. Therefore, coming into existence can actually be an advantage. And I think there are some big flaws in here. Even though it might be the case that the net good on the existence side 
might be greater for some lives. The point is that before coming into existence, they would not have been deprived of that net good. That is the whole point of separating pains and pleasures into four quadrants and then comparing one to three and two to four. Secondly, if you combine Richard's claim with traditional utilitarianism, then it puts a duty on us to create happy people. This might be in line with Richard's religious views, but that is not the view of most utilitarians who prioritize making people happy over making happy people. Richard's second objection is that not all pain is entirely bad. Some types of pain can actually bring about good results. For example, the pain endured by a soldier fighting for the safety and protection of citizens of his country. Here Richard is confusing positive instrumental value of pain with its negative intrinsic value. By instrumental value, I mean the value of something as a means to achieve something else. In Richard's example, the pain endured by soldiers is used as a means of achieving safety for the citizens. But when we talk about antinatalism in general and Benatar's asymmetry in particular, we are not talking about instrumental value of pain. We are talking about its intrinsic value, which is a value in and of itself and which is always negative. So again, in the example of Richard's soldier, the pain he has to endure might have helped achieve something good, but the pain itself is still bad. That is why we use the word endure. We don't use this word for something which is positive. Secondly, those soldiers would prefer not to go through that pain if there were no threats to their citizens. That's because pain in and of itself is still bad. His third objection is Benatar's argument is overly simplistic and the value of existence cannot be captured by the utilitarian calculus of pleasures and pains. That's true and Benatar has clarified that he took pain and pleasure as mere examples of of harms and benefits of life. The Guardian had an article on the pronatalist couple Malcolm and Simon Collins with the title America's Premium Pronatalists on Having Tons of Kids to Save the World. The article is about the experience of a visit of a journalist Jenny Kleeman to their house. So it is not straightforward to pick out arguments for or against having kids in that article but there are some stark contradictions in there. But before I proceed I just want to caution that the arguments I'm going to make might sound like a personal attack on Malcolm and Simone, but they are not. They would only appear as such because I'm pointing the contradictions between what they are portrayed as and their behavior. Malcolm and Simone are said to have a very rational and data-driven approach to all aspects of life, including that of having children. At the time of Jenny's visit, Simone was pregnant with their fourth child, which was conceived using IVF. All of their children have been conceived this way and they plan to have a total of seven children. They have a set of about 34 embryos prepared, out of which they do gene selection for the traits of happiness and intelligence. The ones that are not good are discarded and those that fit their criteria are selected to be brought into existence. Why are they doing all of this? Because they say birth rates are plummeting and if this continues then there'll be no one to take care of the aging population. I don't know if they actually believe that low birth rates are going to cause human extinction but they seem to talk of saving humanity. This sort of language appears at least five times in the article including in the title having tons of kids to save the world. Which is not true. Humans are not going extinct and it is hard to believe that the so-called rational and data-driven people think that. Also at another place the article says but in this numbers game the Collinses need only a few people to join them to save humanity. Those who remain unconvinced will simply die out. By die out here they mean a certain group of people because in individuals would die anyway. But the problem is the groups who do have children would still die out in the sense that the actual people in them would still die. What would remain to continue is a loose notion of a certain group which also keeps on mutating over the generation. So for some abstract notional ideas like culture or nation and so on, they want to bring real suffering beings into existence. This sentiment is reflected all over the article. There is really no regard to the suffering of the children produced as a result. They are just pawns in the game. Just a means to achieve some fantasy in the minds of their parents. The article mentions an incident where Malcolm hits one of his children on the face for a trivial matter in a public place and expresses no remorse for that and in fact tries to justify that they learned this parenting trick from tigers. And at another place, the article notes that for someone dedicated to helping people have as many babies as possible, Malcolm doesn't seem to like children very much. Now, I don't want to use this as an evidence to my claim that they have little regard to the suffering of their children. Even if Malcolm had behaved like a normal loving parent in that instance, and even if he actually liked children, it would not have changed the fact that they used children as a means to achieve their own fantasies. But you might say that happiness was one of their criteria to select or deselect embryos. That's true, but that's because those children could live on to fulfill the fantasies of their parents and not because happiness is intrinsically valuable to them. If that was the case, then they would also have to think of suffering as intrinsically disvaluable. And that would
would have led them to have no children to start with. The other point is about fantasies. What fantasies are we talking about? Well, there are many, but I'll cite just one from the article. Malcolm tells me how pronatalism and space travel are intricately linked. We don't just want to create a sustainable civilization here, we want to expand it outwards to the stars. His branch of effective altruism considers the suffering of humans today to be pretty irrelevant because the suffering of billions of future humans could be eliminated if they succeed in creating a technophilic interplanetary species. Well, if Malcolm is so rational, then he should care to explain why we should expand outward to stars in the first place. Secondly, suffering of billions of future humans could be prevented rather than eliminated by just not creating them in the first place. Prevention is always better than cure. There was also a sort of reactionary article on the conversation.com, which had some bad and some good criticisms of Collins's pronatalism. Now we know that many people who are depressed or have mental health issues are naturally attracted to Towards antinatalism. This is used to present antinatalism itself as a psychological issue rather than a philosophical one. And a response to that is an invitation to look at the actual arguments of antinatalism rather than at antinatalists. A similar thing happens in pronatalism too. Over there, many right-wing people with anxieties of being outbred by another group of people are attracted towards pronatalism. This includes the groups like nationalists, religio-nationalists, ethno-nationalists, and white supremacists and so on. And then it becomes easy to make the mistake of coloring all pronatalists as racists. The article while talking about pronatalism movement says, it's no surprise then when we see white supremacists attending pronatalist events. The movement resonates with infamous 14 words of white supremacy. We must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. This is wrong. Yes, there were white supremacists and eugenicists at the pronatal conference that happened last year at which Malcolm and Simon Collins were speakers. Yes, Malcolm and Simon are okay to work with people like these. Yes, the Collinses have guns in their house and yes, they are Republicans. And yes, racist people are easily attracted to the pronatalist ideology. But it would still be a big mistake to paint Malcolm and Simon with the same brush. Now, I'm not denying the possibility that Collinses might just be closeted white supremacists and they might come out in future. But on the face of what they're saying, we cannot say that they are anything like that. So we cannot call them or the entire pronatalist movement being racist or white supremacist or xenophobic and so on. We have to look at the arguments that they are putting forth. And that brings me to the correct criticism that the article has. Talking about the gene selection of embryos and raising them in unheated homes, the article says, The logic here is that DNA is all important. It doesn't matter that their children's rooms aren't heated or they wear iPads around their necks or that their two-year-old is struck across the face for misbehavior because in the end, nature wins over nurture. The article reiterates my earlier point of little concern for the child itself. In the pronatalist vision, the children themselves seem to be beside the point. The child is less an individual with desires and dignity than a vehicle for a political project, a dense bundle of futurity. And that they are obsessed with abstract anxieties about trillions of people to come in the long-term future. In this numbers game, the child is demoted to a data point. The episode of Malcolm hitting his two-year-old child in the face, in public place, for a trivial matter has gone viral on social media. Most of it has nothing to do with antinatalism except one thing, that it is a pronatal imposition that goes on in every pronatalist household.